Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I just got back from spending about a week with my in-laws uh, and my hubby in Ohio, so that was fun. It was not as humid as it has been for most of the summer, for which I was extremely grateful. Still humid enough that I had really, really dumb hair for a week, but um, yeah, I, I don't have curly hair unless it's humid and then it's not attractive curly <laughs> But eh, that's neither here nor there. I was thinking about um, reading and traveling and airports. And I always have a book with me when I travel. I always have a book with me wherever I go. I've mentioned before. But then when I see other people traveling and reading, I always try to see what they're reading, whether that's the cover of their book or if they're reading on, uh, if, if they're reading an ebook. I try to kind of peek nonchalantly over their shoulder at their book. I'm like a total book stalker, creeper, whatever you want. And I think I'm being subtle, but I bet I'm not. I bet people are like, what in the world is that woman doing? And were I more extroverted like my husband, I would probably just strike up a conversation and talk to them about their books, but I'm not. So I'm just that creepy woman in the airport. If you've been recently book stalked, that may have been me in an airport. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, at any rate, I was reading um, several of the books that we're, uh, I'll be discussing with authors for the next couple of interviews, um, one of which is today's interview with author D.A. Bartley about her new book, Death in the Covenant. This is part of a series, the Abish Taylor Mystery Series, and um, this is the second in that series. Let me go ahead and give you the description. Detective Abish, Abby Taylor, returned to the mountain town of Pleasant View, Utah, hoping for a quiet life. But that hope dissipates when she wakes to an unsettling phone call. Arriving at the scene of a fatal car accident, she discovers that the victim was one of the most beloved leaders of the church and an old family friend. Abby is skeptical when her father insists the death was not an accident, but in an attempt to patch up their relationship, she takes a few days off from her job as the sole detective in the police department and heads to Colonia Juarez, a former LDS colony in Mexico. There, she uncovers a plan hearkening back to the church's history of polygamy. But Abby knows too well that bringing secrets to light can be deadly. When she returns to the States, some members of the LDS community certainly don't seem happy that Abby knows what she knows. Abby realizes with a jolt that her investigation could cost her father his job and possibly get him excommunicated. Time is running out for Abby to save her father's position and her own life as dark forces close in and the outlook for the pleasant for pleasant view turns decidedly unpleasant. That is the second of the Abish Taylor mystery series. It is called again Death in the Covenant. It is by D. A. Bartley, whom I'll be speaking with in a couple of minutes in this interview. Uh, the first book of the series is called A Gathering of Secrets. And this is a fast, I mean, it's a fascinating book from a mystery perspective, but also a fascinating book in terms of the history of the Mormon church of the, the, um, the Latter-day Saints, the LDS church. It's a, it's, you get kind of both an inside and an outside perspective because the main character, Abby, grew up in the church and um, was very active in the church growing up, but has um, left the church. But she's gone back to Utah um, to be closer to her family. And there's all sorts of family dynamics and um, difficulties because she does live in a predominantly Mormon area. And so her having left the church causes all kinds of relationship problems. Plus, she is a female detective in a very male oriented um, job plus a very patriarchal society. So all kinds of really interesting dynamics, but also all kinds of really fascinating history, Mormon history. And we talk some about that in the 
interview, uh, as I say in the interview, I, I have friends that I grew up with, very good friends that were, that are Mormon. And so I, I know a little bit about the, the church, but um, re- learning more and, and uh, having it couched in this, this novel, in this mystery was really, really fascinating for me. And I uh, really enjoyed reading the book. And I, I want to know, I definitely need to go back and read the first one. And then I want to know what happens next with Abby and her family and all these relationships. So with that, let's go ahead and turn to the interview with D.A. Bartley. Again, the book is called Death in the Covenant. And I do have copies to give away. So stay tuned until the end of the interview to find out how to win a copy of Death in the Covenant by D.A. Bartley. And now let's go ahead and turn to that interview. Hi, D.A. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. It's so great to be here. I am really excited to talk to you, and we are going to talk about your book, Death in the Covenant. Um, Before we get to the book, though, would you just share a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you a bit? Sure. I'm a little bit of a I would say orphan, but that's not quite the right word. So I'm, I'm, I've moved around a lot. I was actually born in Scotland because my dad was in graduate school at the University of Edinburgh, but we moved back to Ogden, Utah, where all of my family was when I was about two, which is why I do not have a charming Scottish accent. <laughs> we lived in Utah. I, know, I wish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we lived in Utah till I was about 10, and then my parents, who both were incurable travelers, decided that we should see Europe. So we lived in France for about a year and then moved to Germany where we lived for several years. And then I moved back to Utah for high school. In terms of sort of my Mormon background, which is sort of relevant for my books, I am a member of the Daughters of Utah Pioneers, which basically means that I come from a family who lived in the state of Deseret, now the state of Utah, before the Transcontinental Railroad was finished in 1869. And when I sort of have done some genealogical work, I found one side of my family actually lived in Nauvoo, Illinois, before Joseph Smith was killed in 1844. So very, very early converts to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then another side of my family converted in Sweden in the 1850s and traveled from Malmö to New York and then walked to Salt Lake, pushing handcarts, as you know, like, because I, yeah, I was descended from the poor people. So there wasn't, uh, there were handcarts, no, no covered wagons. (laughs) That's amazing. I can't even imagine, actually. I know I, I sometimes I've been living in, in New York City for the last 20 years. It's the place I've lived the longest on the planet. And every time I find myself grumbling on a cold winter's day as I have to walk 20 blocks, I'm like, OK, Allison, you know, get a grip. This actually isn't <laughs> yeah. so bad. Right. right. Oh, wow. That would be an amazing trip. Um so thank you for that. And we are going to talk about the second book of the series. But before we get to that one, let's just uh, let's start at the beginning and talk about the series itself. Can you give a bit of an overview of maybe the first book and the concept of the series? Sure. Um, it's so the, it's, it centers around a detective, Abish Taylor. I, she's called Abby by most people. Her father always called her Abish. And she grew up in a in Utah in a large Mormon family. And I think one of the things that I like the most about this series is, yes, there's this Mormon stuff. Yes, there's this Utah stuff that can seem very foreign and sort of different for people from the outside. But at the core, it's about family and relationships within family, intense relationships. And so some of the relationships that I like the most are Abby and her dad and Abby and her brother. So her father is a respected Mormon apologist, and he's the head of the Department of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University. And Abby left for for college, and then she also left the church. And this, of course, is a, is a, a source of tension in her family. She didn't think she would ever come back to Utah, but her husband died unexpectedly, and she sort of feels compelled to go back and try to fix things with her family, some of her family who really don't want much to do with her anymore. And she's sort of lost a little bit. And she gets back to Utah. And in the first book, there's a rather uh, macabre murder scene, although I, I'm very G-rated. So, so <laughs> you know that it's kind of, it's it's unpleasant. Uh, but you don't really see much of it because I actually can't tolerate. I can't tolerate that sort of stuff myself. 
So yeah. you know what happens, but yeah. And the the murder is reminiscent of a certain sort of of blood atonement. So uh, which was a sort of a theory that was discussed in the Reformation period in the 1850s and 60s with Brigham, Brigham Young. And I found as I was writing it that it really was kind of fun to play around with Mormon history and some of the doctrine that has been sort of forgotten and tie it into present day. So the, the series all takes place in current day Utah in, you know, 2018, 2019. But the motivations for some of the murders are tied up with this sort of belief system. And I, I find it's actually a lot of fun for me. So the first book had blood atonement in it. The second book has another sort of very well-known aspect of Mormon <laughs> history tied up in mm-hmm. it as well. So mm-hmm. there, I, I hope, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I like, I think it's fascinating because I'm learning a lot about in the second book. Um, the issue is one that's fairly, I think it may be the one thing that people think they know about the Mormon church. Yes. Um, but you get so much of the history and so much more insight as to what people both inside and outside of the church think about it. So I really enjoyed that. Um, was that your Thank jumping you. off point? <laughs> sure. Was that your jumping off point for the story or did you have another another inspiration for Death in the Covenant? For Death in the Covenant, I did have another inspiration because I, I didn't really imagine I would be writing this idea right now. I actually had... Um, I had another idea and it just sort of wasn't going anywhere. And I came across John, I want to say Berger, but it might be Berger's uh, article, What Two Religions Tell Us About the Modern Dating Crisis. And he explores how shifting demographics affect both Mormon and Orthodox Jewish communities in the United States. And he sort of played off of Trinity College's American Religious Identification Survey, where they talked to people about religions in 2015. He uh, set out that, you know, set out the statement that for every 150 Mormon women in the state of Utah, there are 100 Mormon men. And apparently that is a, there's a similar sort of demographic imbalance among Orthodox Jewish communities in Brooklyn. So he started looking at how these religious communities were dealing with this because both communities are one where you're supposed to marry within the religion, right? Mm-hmm. So you don't want to mm-hmm. have interfaith marriages. And I read the article and then I was like sent back in time to being like nine years old in Sunday school and hearing these stories about Mormon history and going, oh my goodness, this is what I want you to write about. <laughs> and uh, that's, I guess that's all I can say without giving way too much away. Right, right. But then there's a mystery, you know, there's a, a murder and the, um, so that that kind of leads to a deeper investigation regarding the issue that you're speaking of and it's all tied together and you have to, Abby has to sort through all those pieces. Yes. Yes, she does. And, and she, she, she does it both. I think it's like an insider and an outsider, which is sort of an interesting place to be. I actually think it's a place where a lot of us live, quite frankly, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, we feel like we're part of something, but we also feel like we're not quite part of something. And that also is sort of an interesting emotional place to explore. And I feel like this is a good time to jump in here with uh, our first break of the podcast. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, DA was talking about 
Abby's life as kind of both an insider and an outsider in terms of having grown up in the Mormon church, but now having left, but having come back to Utah. So all these different dynamics. And um, so just to catch you up and remind you what we were talking about before the break, let's go ahead and get back to that interview. Yeah, and Abby's also interesting Interesting because she is a woman in a male kind of dominated workplace in a very patriarchal um, church system. So she has, she has a bit of an uphill battle in terms of investigating and being effective in how she investigates. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think... Uh patriarchal systems are it is absolutely part of her everyday life and i think for her not only is being a, a working woman a tough thing but she's a working woman who isn't married who doesn't have children and doesn't go to church and right. all of those things together mean that she she has to deal with with some difficulties on the other hand like i love her partner jim clark return missionary nicest guy on the planet. I absolutely adore writing him. I adore thinking about how he views things. And he's just such a fundamentally good guy. And he, he is also in a, in a tough position because I feel like in terms of, you know, sort of a, an underlying patriarchal system, which is supported also by the fact that men have the priesthood and women do not have the priesthood. And so there's that underlying sort of spiritual hierarchy as well. Mm -hmm. And he's struggling with it too, you know, and so he sometimes has to make decisions uh, that, that may not go along with what the rest of the elders and the brethren would, would go along with. And that's also interesting, I think. And current, maybe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and I agree. I like, I, I like Clark as a character. He's, um, I, I'm, so, you know, you sort of slowly get to know him, but I think there's, I think there's more to learn about him as the series goes on. Uh, but in terms of Abby, what do you think as a, with her as the protagonist, what do you think about her will resonate with readers? You know, I like Abby um, a lot. And I, I, I like her more every time I go back and I'm writing a new manuscript. I think of her fundamentally as that she's really tough, but then she also is always trying to do the right thing. And those two things, it's sometimes hard because when life beats you up, and, and Abby has had life sort of beat her up, and she, and I mean, and we all kind of do. There are times when you're just like, really? Can I not catch a break? Yeah. And it's really hard to get angry and bitter and sort of close yourself off and not try to be open minded and open hearted. And I think she really tries to hold on to those things, even in the face of some of, of adversity and challenge and, and loss. And that's at her core. I think that's what I like the most about Abby. And I think that's what makes her compelling as a character because we want her to be tough we want her to be able to sort of do things but she's also she's also vulnerable mm -hmm. yeah and um is there a story behind her full name because it's a little unusual well maybe for someone outside <laughs> of the lds church i know that there's a part in the book where she's reading a story that has the name abish in it to small children so what, <laughs> what what's the story there Oh, such a good question. Thank you for asking it. I, I will tell you, when I started writing the very first book, I was probably 10 chapters in and she didn't have a name. I, I knew what she looked like. I knew what she, I knew that she generally drank her coffee black in the morning. I knew all these things about her and I didn't have a really good name. I kept on you know, coming back for a name and everything seemed wrong. And then I sort of remembered that growing up in Utah, a lot of my friends who were boys were named after church leaders, prophets, and characters in the Book of Mormon, but there weren't girls with those names. And that the book that you're referring to, that came out f long after I'd grown up. That's a very <laughs> recent book. Okay. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I want to take a look at what we've got in the Book of Mormon. Now, this is an interesting sort of side note. In the Book of Mormon, there are hundreds of characters that are named. Only five women are named about about mm -hmm. a handful of women are named and two of them are biblical characters abish is one of those characters who female characters who is named and i just like i'm like why did i not remember this name this is such a perfect name she can be abby she can be abs and then 
I decided to make her a tailor. So she is part of this sort of Mormon aristocracy. She's descended from the third prophet of the church, John Taylor. And that actually plays a role in this. He actually was a, was a big proponent of polygamy. And uh, I think we've been hinting around that. For, for yes, yes. <laughs> and, and so she has this historical connection with, uh, with polygamy as well. So that's her, that's her name. And I, as soon as I wrote it down, I was like, that is the perfect name. So I actually really love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, what kind of research did you do for the book? You know, I now that I I live in a place where church is not the central part of everybody's life, I I sort of have forgotten how much time you spend learning religion. So when I was growing up, we spent three hours at church on Sunday. We generally had church-related activities all during the week. And then in high school, I went to, I did early morning seminary. So so before school started, I would get up at 6.15 probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, no, I was at school at 6.15. So I was awake before then. (laughs) I blocked that from my memory. Um, (laughs) Sure. And and so I've spent a lot of time studying religion and doctrine and scriptures of of the Mormon church. Now, having said that, I'm extraordinarily skeptical of my own memories and I doubt everything. (laughs) So I always go back when it comes to sort of the factual things, because I think it's important for me and I think for readers too, to sort of trust that when you're reading something that is fiction, but there are references to sort of factual things, that those facts are right. So I really do my my best to make sure that all of that is correct. And and you know, I don't know if you know like I I'm a lawyer and an academic by training, have a PhD in political science and I went to law school and so I I do love to research and getting the facts right kind of matters to me personally. So I do I am always skeptical of my memories of times when I was, you know, 8 and 12 and whatever. I'm like, okay, am I remember, remembering this correctly? So that's where the research starts. It's pretty much from my memories. Okay. Well, and there, I, I think it's important to have things factual because there, I think there's so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about the Mormon church. Um, people think maybe they know what it's about, but they don't really. And so to be able to read this and learn more and understand more of some of those doctrines and what the what actual churchgoers believe in and understand, I think that's really, really helpful. Oh, thank you. I I hope so. I mean, I clearly am, you know, it's it's one perspective, but I agree with you. I, I personally love to read fiction that takes place in a in an environment and a world that I don't necessarily know well. And I love learn I love learning about the world that way. So I'm assuming that there I hope there are other people who feel the same way. Mm-hmm. I think there are. I, I had a, <laughs> a, two of my very best friends in high school were actually Mormon, and uh, their dad was the president of the stake in my my tiny tiny hometown. Um, mm-hmm. So, like some of this is familiar, but we we kind of had the, a mutual we don't talk about religion <laughs> in our in our friendship. Um, and I actually actually dated um, the the brother in that relationship in that in that family for a while but um so i feel like i have a a better understanding of the lds church but still you know that it's it's good to get a a different perspective on what i learned from from them and their family yeah undoubtedly i'm sure you do and and if you are good friends with even if you say you're not going to talk about religion religion is generally really central to active women lives yeah and yeah. so, I mean, I, I actually love that, that your friends were like, we care about our friendship and let's not let the fact that we have different belief systems interfere with us being human beings. I mean, that right. actually, I think, I mean, that's what we, I would love our whole society to sort of be more like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't have a problem, you know, I would, I would pray with them in the evenings when they would do their evening prayer, you know, those sorts of things. <laughs> yeah. But, but like the uh, the the Mormon elders lived in their basement, um, <laughs> they had the basement apartment. And, you know, there was, oh, that's so yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like you know, the, the, you don't need to you don't really need to go talk to them. They're fine. <laughs> oh, oh, that's um, good. So you you weren't like uh, on an investigator list where they were like, here we'll talk to you about the Mormon Church. Would you like a book of Mormon? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I talked to them plenty at the house. So they never really came oh. to our house. <laughs> that's so, really nice. 
it was fascinating and we're still we're still friends now but um <laughs> I, I i did enjoy reading this book and, and being like oh okay i kind of understand that and now i understand it better <laughs> um, oh that's great so in in terms of some of the history and the doctrine um how do you decide what to include i mean it, it's it's very central because of Abby's family, um, but how do you decide how much to include and, ha- and and how to walk that line between, you know, making it part of her life and, and maybe too much? Ah, okay. Actually, I wish I could say that I was really good at this, and I, I think I can say I'm unequivocally terrible at it. Because, <laughs> um, and ha- happily, I have a really good editor. So in this particular book, I sort of fell down this rabbit hole and was obsessed with the um, case law on polygamy. So the Mormon church brought a number of cases, a lot of cases to the U.S. Supreme Court in the 19th century. And I was sort of obsessed with it. And my editor was like going, uh, yeah, not so much. <laughs> so, so when I go astray, uh, I have somebody who'll go back and say, okay, let's just have a hint of this. We don't need to go into that. And, and quite frankly, that is completely correct because what matters most is the story. So I, I think as I'm writing more, like this is now the second book and I'm working on the third, I'm learning, I hope, to approach it in, in a way that gives you enough understanding for a reader to sort of understand the motivations and what's going on for the primary story, which really is the mystery, right? It's the puzzle. It's, it's you know, who did what and why, who done it? And so I do try to follow the story and the story does lead inevitably to some of these, you know, these questions that deal with, with belief systems. But then to pull it back, because if you wanted to read a nonfiction book on whatever the doctrine of scriptures, you'd pick that up, you know? So I, I try to sort of <laughs> not go too far in, in depth, but just, just enough and just enough so that somebody who's unfamiliar with it can understand what's going on and mm-hmm. that their eyes don't start to glaze over. <laughs> right, right. That reminds me of the scene where the lawyer comes in and he's, he's going to tell them this whole spiel about all of these cases, and they're like, thank you, goodbye. <laughs> I know, I know. Actually, I loved writing that scene because I used to practice law, and I remember, <laughs> I was sort of sort of relieved. Where I'm like, oh, actually, I don't need to listen to this whole thing. I'm going to actually shut him up and kick him out of the room. <laughs> nice. Um, how is it for you writing um, this book? Because you, you and Abby are a little similar in that, you know, you grew up in the church, but you're not there now. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it ever a little strange for you to immerse yourself in this world for writing? I like to go back and think about the things and have a little bit of distance. Abby is in it, and it's fun to see how she deals with being in Utah and not part of the religion. But we're not the same person. and. I lo- I wish I were more like Abby. The one thing that I do think that I share with Abby that is sort of very similar is we both have very close relationships with our brothers. And that's one of the things as I was writing the sort of the end of the first book, and it's definitely here in the second book, is that relationship with with her one, there's one brother she's very close with. The rest of her siblings sort of have stepped away as she's left the church. And I only have one brother. I don't come from a big Mormon family. But and my brother is younger than mine is than I am and Abby's brother is older. But I find when I'm writing that, that's where I think I connect with Abby the most, is that her relationship with her brother is very similar to my relationship with my brother. I actually talk to him pretty much every single day. And he now he was living in California, now he's living in Utah. And we're really close and that that's the one thing I guess where I feel I share the most with Abby. And then I also share with her the fact that we both like to cook. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although she doesn't have as much time to cook as I do. <laughs> right, right. Well, especially in this book, I don't think she cooks at all, hardly. Yeah, she, uh, I mean, <laughs> she feels bad because her brother cooks for her. I think yeah. that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, her brother cooks and Flynn cooks, and I'm, yes. not, and I'm not sure Abby <laughs> cooks. Um, I think she's tired in this book. She does in the first is. book. You're right. She's tired. She's tired. She is tired. Um, I don't have insomnia like Abby does, but I am also tired. So let's take a break. (laughs) 
let's take a 30 second break and I'll take a quick nap. Not not really. But let's do take that second break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll have the conclusion to the interview with D.A. Bartley about her new book, Death in the Covenant. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Podcast. Let me just give you a little bit of an introduction to this next segment because um, if you're wondering why I sound, well, even more awkward than I usually do starting a sentence, it's because I had to edit out me completely losing my train of thought. I couldn't think of what I was going to ask and then it came to me and then I sort of just launched into it in the mid, in mid thought slash mid sentence. So more insight probably than you needed into my interviewing techniques, but there you have it. <laughs> Uh, do you have an extended family, and, and what do they think of the book? I do have ex- uh, almost all of my family lives in Utah, and everybody has been supportive, which has been really nice. I was a little worried about it before the first book came out, and I sort of reached out to everybody and said, "Hey, I love you all, and I know you all are are want to be supportive." But don't feel like you have to be read buy the book, read the book, or like the book. It's okay. Mm-hmm. And and it's been actually much it's been much easier than I had than I had expected. So that's been really nice. I you know, mm-hmm. I've my close family, of course, like my father is my biggest cheerleader, so I, I, I suspect that no matter what I would write, he would <laughs> He would buy six copies and say, "Oh, this is wonderful," <laughs> and uh, and then you know my brother is of course also you know really really supportive. So I you know and my mother has passed away, so my my close family is is actually very small, but my cousins have all been you know all really wonderful and and yes I do have a, a big extended Mormon family. I know when my daughter was born, she was great grandchild number twenty three. Oh my goodness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So there, there are, and and everyone's just been wonderful. So, you know, that's that speaks a lot about, you know, that speaks well of just how supportive people can be. And I guess actually, if we come back around, it sort of gets back to your friendship with your friends who had a different belief system, and you're like, okay, that's all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The same sort of thing. It's nice. It is. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the series, do you have kind of an overall arc that you envision, or are you just going to write as long as Abby is speaking to you? <laughs> I I would like to write as long as Abby is speaking to me. I will say, however, that there's a there's an arc that goes from the first to the third. That there are certain characters where things are a little bit messy after the first, a little bit messy after the second, and there are some people who may redeem themselves, some people who may not, and some sort of stories that will be tied up at the end of the third, which I think will be interesting because that will leave me for from then, from then on to sort of explore some different themes with some different characters. I mean, I... Jim Clark, Clark, I want to stay with for, you know, I love him. And mm-hmm. so I can't imagine that he and Abby could be apart. But and but there are some other characters who I think are really important that might find some ends of their storylines in the third book and then then go on from there for as long as readers want to read about Abby. Great, um, thank you. And do you? I know you you said you're working on the third book. Do you have a, a time frame for when that one might come out? 
that is with my agent and publisher right now. So that decision is not in my head. That is a decision above my pay grade. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> not a problem. You're working on, you're, you're like, I'm, we're talking about the second one. Geez, just hang in there. <laughs> Slow down. Um, exactly. Exactly. So you have a PhD, you're a lawyer by trade. When did you decide that you wanted to start writing fiction? Is it something that you've always wanted to do or did it come later in life? I'm a super duper late bloomer. <laughs> and and in fact, this is a, this is a really good question. It's a little bit of a hard question for me to answer because and I I guess I'll just, you know, say up front, it's sort of I like to think of it as a series of unfortunate events that led me to this. I have always been a mystery reader. Like my my grandma, my mom and I would would read mysteries. They both introduced me to Agatha Christie. I think that but Agatha Christie was my first grown-up book that I ever read. Like, I don't know. We all have those books, like when we're 10 and 11, that are the grown-up books. And for me, mm-hmm. it was Agatha Christie. So I, and I devour those classic mysteries. That's, that's my happy place, like reading P.D. James for, you know, an entire weekend, just snuggle on the couch is like my idea of heaven. And, but I never thought really ever that I would write fiction. Uh, and then my mother had Alzheimer's and she, for about 10 years before she passed away. And in the last several years of her life, I was flying back to Utah really as much as I could. My dad was taking care of her largely on his own. And it was hard. And on one of those trips, I went to visit a friend of mine who had moved up to Ogden, actually up to Pleasant View. <laughs> and we went for a walk around her neighborhood and that's where I saw the house, which in the first book is where the first body is discovered in this house. I got back to New York. I really sort of didn't think about it. I got back to New York, and I just sort of, I might have been reading a P.D. James at the time. I, I had this house in my head. And I came back from a run along the East River, and I sat down to my computer, and I started writing, which was really weird. I had never written fiction before, never thought about writing fiction before. I wrote things that tended to put people to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> legal documents and academic documents like really right, who wants right. who wants to do that so i i wrote about seven chapters and then sort of put it away and a few days later this is the second unfortunate event my daughter uh got a, a concussion playing lacrosse and at the time the the medical advice was she should be in a dark room couldn't read couldn't look at a screen couldn't do anything so basically mm-hmm a really bad space for a teenage girl to be in. Yeah. yeah. And so I'd gotten her some, some audio books, and she complained that she didn't like the voices. And so she asked me, she says, well, what are you writing, Mom? And I told her, and she said, well, well, read it to me. So I read as much as I'd written, and she said, well, what happens next? And I looked at her and said, I don't know. And she said, well, go write more. So for the course of about the next two weeks, while she napped, I would write, and then when she woke up, I would read to her, and then she'd nap, and I'd write. And after she was better and was back at school, and she is perfectly healthy, she's a happy sophomore in college right now, brain mm-hmm. functioning perfectly well, I was halfway through what was supposed to be, you know, a, well, what became the first book. And so I was just like, well, I might as well finish this and see where it goes. And that's actually that's actually how it all started for me. And now that I'm in it, I can't imagine not being in it. It's such a strange, obvious thing to be doing, but I really hadn't thought about becoming a writer until I was in my early 40s, mid-40s. Uh-huh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that story, though, because, you know, how many teenagers want to want their mom to read to them, especially what they've been writing? Um, <laughs> oh, I, I never thought about that. You're right. I guess that is actually really sweet. <laughs> it's really awesome. I mean, that, that, maybe there are more out there than I can imagine, but um, I, I just picture a lot of eye rolling usually. <laughs> oh, I love that. I I never thought about it that way. That's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so do you then, from from your experience of coming to this, do you have advice for aspiring authors? You know, I mean, take it with a grain of salt, because what do I know? <laughs> but I, I think the more voices we have out there, the better. And, and however that is. So I think persistence, and I will, I'll say this, like, just keep on writing and know that it's all sort of a learning experience. I wrote the, the manuscript, the first manuscript that I thought was done. And it was completely not. 
and that's okay. Like I ended up cutting the first four chapters, which basically I wrote just for me. And now I know pretty much a lot of writers, first-time writers, do that sort of thing. Just keep at it because there's something there. If you feel like there's a story there, it's good to get it out. And so I think do it. And then find a find your tribe. Find a place where there are people to support you. There are so many great writing organizations out there. I mean, in in the suspense genre, you have Mystery Writers of America, you have Sisters of Crime, Sisters in Crime. It's you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. And I know I have friends who write middle grade stuff. I have friends who write romance, friends who write fantasy. There are groups out there. Find them because it is a solitary activity. And that's probably why a lot of people are drawn to it. It's really wonderful to live in that world. But sometimes it's nice to have some friends. And so keep at it and then find your friends. Find the people that will be there to help you along who are at different points along the writing journey. And uh, and stick there. Stick stick with it, with your group. Mm-hmm. Nice. Thank you. Um, I know that you obviously love Agatha Christie, P.D. James. Do you have other favorite authors or genres when you read? Oh, okay. Other, I, I have <laughs> lately been reading memoirs, which is so funny because if you'd asked me six months ago, do you like memoirs? I'd say, I don't really read memoirs. And then I realized I read both Educated and Shrill back to back. And I'm like, okay, clearly I'm doing some memoirs. And then I have a friend, Evie Minieri, who writes fantasy, and I had never thought about reading fantasy. And because she's written it, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna like, I'm going to try to read this. I am pretty eclectic, I guess, when I don't, when I'm not in my happy space. Like I will always come back to, to mystery and suspense, just because I think that's how my mind works. But uh, I am enjoying reading some different, you know, some different, different things too. And I think it's sort of, uh, for now that I'm a writer as well as a reader, it's wonderful to see how other people deal with the same problems and, and challenges that, that I have and go, oh, my goodness, that's, that's so amazing. And I do still have, like, lots of uh, actual hardcover books as I'm looking at my shelves of my suspense stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, I like to read across the board, I guess. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. And um, where can people find you? Do you have a website? Where can they find you on social media? Fill us in on all that good stuff. Okay. Uh, DABartley.com is the website. I am on Facebook as DA Bartley Author and also on Twitter. I try to stay up with it. I do find I, I do find that being on social media all the time is not sort of particularly healthy for my uh, my sort of outlook on life, and so I, I, I dip in periodically. I think I've pulled back a little bit in in uh, recent months, but I do stay on there because it is a lovely way to communicate and to sort of be out there in the world, uh, particularly if I'm not there all the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and I love to hear from I love to hear from readers. So absolutely, reach out to me. I may not be right there on that given moment, but I do try to check in every day um, for some period of time. I don't know what everyone else is doing with social media these days. It seems like everybody is sort of reconsidering it a little bit. Right. And and maybe I'm in that space right now, too, of so reconsidering exactly how I interact and trying to sort of really be positive. Uh, and I, I love that. In fact, I had a reader post, and I love this, a reader post on my Facebook page that my publicist had put out the, the picture, a picture of the cover of Death in the Covenant, and the background looked like it was from the West, but it actually wasn't. It was actually in Australia. And this reader was like, this doesn't look like it's in Utah. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, thank you so much for this catch. <laughs> and then, then we all went back and it all got changed. And I was like, thank you. And then she wrote back, and she's with a smiley face, oh, so good. And I was like, see, we can all actually be kind to each other in this environment mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Wouldn't that be nice if I did know? <laughs> One can dream. <laughs> yes. Well, we have talked about a lot of different topics, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would like for people to know about this series or about um, Death in the Covenant specifically? Anything that we haven't covered on writing or this series? Oh, sorry. This has been so delightful. I think we've covered so so much. I would add, I hope that my stories sort of inspire 
readers to think about what we choose to believe and how that can impact our lives. Because I really sort of think that we all, I certainly believe this, that, that what I think and what my intent my actions and how I perceive the world and how I engage with the world. And I think that that's sort of an important thing to to be mindful of. So I guess mm-hmm. that's, that would be my, that would be the only, that would be the only thing that I would add. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. I really enjoyed um, speaking with you and enjoyed the book. Can't wait for the rest of the series. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. This has just been such a delightful way to start my, my day talking to you. <laughs> Nice. Thank you. That's much better than what you could have said. <laughs> I do like when an interview can end on some laughter and, uh, you know, a positive note. So I, um, I'm thankful that I was not an unpleasant way to start the day. <laughs> Thank you so much to D.A. Bartley for taking the time out of her weekend last weekend to talk to me and for being flexible about time because I was trying to fit in things between family engagements. So she was awesome in that way. She was awesome to chat with. I so enjoyed our conversation. I hope you did as well. Um, you I hope that you will check out the book. It is called Death in the Covenant. It is a really good read, very intense, very informative, very, um, just an enjoyable book uh, for a mystery, you know, not, not like overly scary, but intense and um, suspenseful. So if, if you're into mysteries that don't scare the pants off you, this is a really good one, (laughs) which I I tend to be somewhat of a wimp, as you know. Um, If you would like to maybe win a copy of Death in the Covenant, you just have to go to our uh, social media pages, GSMC Book Review, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and comment on the uh, post with this episode. comment on the post this episode it's episode 176 interview with da bartley again that is gsmc book review instagram facebook or twitter and comment on this post you'll be automatically entered to win a copy of death in the covenant by da bartley if you're a fan of mysteries you should definitely check that out and see about winning a copy of that book thank you once again to da thank you as always to you my listeners i hope you have had a wonderful week. Uh, My apologies for getting this interview out a day or so late. I've traveled and then had jet lag and I was trying to fit everything in. And so I'm a little later than I normally am, for which I apologize. But thank you as always for listening, for tuning in, for supporting the podcast, for supporting authors and being uh, lovers of books. I can't thank you enough for that. Hope you have a tomorrow's Friday. So I hope you have a wonderful three-day weekend if you get one. And hopefully during part of that weekend, you'll be able to find some time to go get lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program